Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and I will do a brief introduction for our speaker. I'm Cindy Payne. I'm a professor in the Department of Human Ecology here at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. And th uh, this talk is one in the series that the Department of Human Ecology has been putting on this fall. In fact, it's the first. Um, it's called Governance in the Anthropocene, and we're, it's co-sponsored today by the Rutgers Climate Institute. Our next speaker uh, is going to be, on October 16th, Alvaro Fernandez Yamazares, talking about biocultural <coughs> conservation in the Amazon Basin, and that talk will be in Blake 131, so we hope to see you there. Now, I get to introduce my longtime colleague as an environmental law professor, Randy Abate, who is the inaugural, I saw bait. <laughs> Both work <laughs> in the in US. <laughs> he is the inaugural Rechnick's Family Endowed Chair in Marine Environmental Law and Policy and professor in the Department of Political Science and Sociology at Monmouth University. We're very happy that he decided to return to New Jersey despite the winters last year, <laughs> after teaching law in Florida for a number of years, and he has had also a distinguished teaching career at Vermont Law School, Widener, and our own Rutgers Law in Campbell. His new book with Cambridge University Press, which comes out in October, is going to be the subject of his talk today, Climate Change and the Voiceless. It may have been influenced somewhat by his teaching, which over the years has included constitutional law, environmental law, international environmental law, natural resources and indigenous peoples, and climate law and justice, and animal law. So he has published prolifically on these topics. Now we'll have the opportunity to hear about his most recent project. And when I say prolifically, this piece of paper that I'm holding up has, in seven point type, a list of his <laughs> papers. So do look at his website and catch some of the other uh, writings that he's done. And also, if you're here in the room, over on the table there, there are some of uh, Randy's books. So yeah, Randy, can I give you the floor? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Simi, and thank you, Marjorie and Climate Institute and all of the sponsors of this uh, talk. It's a thrill to be here. Strangely enough, even after having taught at Rutgers Camden Law School from 2001 to 2006, I've never been on the main campus of Rutgers. Uh, so it's uh, particularly enjoyable to be here finally and to hopefully build new relationships now that I'm at Monmouth, just a 45 minute drive. Uh, uh, working on a lot of similar issues across our two campus campuses. Uh, I'm affiliated with the Urban Coast Institute at Monmouth, so we're doing a lot of work on marine and coastal issues and climate change adaptation, and Rutgers is just a gold mine for many of these topics and uh, uh, someone we look to as a partner and source of inspiration for a lot of the work that we do. Um, one primary reason that I was pulled into undergraduate teaching after being a law professor for 24 years, which many of my law professor colleagues have looked askance at me ever since I did make that decision, uh, is because I value interdisciplinary inquiry and collaboration. I've just been a kid in a candy store now on a college campus and being, being able to just walk across campus in different directions and collaborate with colleagues that are relevant to my interest in climate change and animal law and how that cuts across many dif disciplines, um, including biology and psychology and sociology and economics. So climate change for me has been a real passion for about the past 15 years, and it's because of that interdisciplinary nature. And even if I didn't like collaborating with other people, I would have to because I don't have that expertise across several disciplines. I'm trained as an environmental lawyer and that's about as far as it goes. I even came to environmental law without any science background. So the fact that there is this ongoing inter interdisciplinary collaboration is really exciting and it's exciting to have an audience like this, which is 
somewhat non-traditional for these book talks in the sense that most of my audiences are law professors, lawyers, law students, and um, I'm getting more in the non-law domain and I really enjoy those the most. It's nice to have that perspective from outside the law. So, so this version of the talk is going to be more tailored to a non-law audience and please interrupt me at any time if I'm making assumptions about the things I talk about on a daily basis regarding the law that, that don't make sense. Um, I want to give you first a little bit of a, a context for uh, the book project when I uh, begin today and give you a sense of what this concept of the voiceless is about for purposes of this book um, and how climate change is underlying the focus for the book really as the driving problem and potentially an opportunity for a solution in protecting the voiceless. And I'll briefly give you some history about environmental regulation, how where we've been and where we are is not where we should be when it comes to regulating climate change generally and when it comes to regulating voiceless communities. Um, I'll provide a fair amount of detail on that so you get a sense of what what I'm proposing uh, needs to change. And I'll give you some developments in the law that even many lawyers are not aware of, and they're quite fascinating and encouraging, about each separate category of the voiceless. We're seeing great progress in the courts, in legislatures across the world, to some degree in the US, but not as much as I'd like to see. But we're seeing great progress in protecting individual categories of the voiceless without regard for the other two. So we're seeing developments in animal rights, we're seeing developments in rights of nature, we're seeing developments in protection of future generations. Um, but this book project is about bringing those three categories together as sharing a vulnerability and sharing an opportunity for additional protection under the law. So I'll be giving you a very quick and diluted summary of what the, what the proposal in the book is about how to go about supporting those uh, protections that don't yet exist. So just as a, a basic starting point uh, in terms of how the book is set up, by the voiceless, I mean those entities that are not able to speak for themselves under the law. So for purposes of this project, there's three categories. It's not an exhaustive list, but three distinct categories. One is a human category, future generations. That would be current children and the unborn of humans. And then populations of wildlife and natural resources um, as the third category. And these three categories share that common lack of legal protection in the sense that they're not able to go into court and represent their interests when they are being potentially harmed by certain activities the way humans can do. And, and that alone as a starting proposition is very controversial for many people because many people think the law and its protections are really for humans. And it's just up to humans to take care of those who can't speak literally for themselves and go into court and represent their interests. And so I'll, I'll be reminding you how the law is very well established in representing interests of those who cannot go into court on their own behalf. Can you think of any examples of how the law already recognizes um, some voiceless entities, non-human entities that, that do get represented in court? Yes? Some uh, mentally disabled people. Absolutely. So, they're certainly human, but when we talk about humans that are not able to speak for themselves, we have a long list of the way the law recognizes that even though you can't get in and represent your own interest on your own behalf, you, the law does protect your interests by appointing representatives to protect your interests. So that would be mentally disabled, children, uh, people in a coma, fetuses. Um, there are ways in which the law offers protection to those that do not yet speak. Yes? Corporations. Corporations is absolutely the, the big one. Even though corporations are organizations of people, the corporation itself is not a, a human person speaking on behalf of itself. Yes? 
Yes, so there, there are certain other entities where there is going to be legal representation, and we're going to talk more about that in the context of, of rights of nature. So there are a variety of non-human people or entities that also get representation through the legal system. Ships is another one recognized as having legal personhood. So what I want to stress and, and how you ought to think about this idea of what it means to have personhood protection under the law is that personhood really means who matters under the law, who is worthy of protection. It's not about how human or human-like you are. It is about a determination that the law has made that you and your interests matter and therefore those interests deserve representation. It doesn't matter whether someone is speaking on your behalf to represent those interests as we commonly see with children and their interests being represented by guardians in divorce proceedings and so forth. The law has made a determin de determination that the children's interests matter a great deal and deserve protection and they proceed from there. So I want you to be thinking that way in a unified sense that these three categories of the voiceless are worthy of legal protection. That's a starting point. And the second point is how very much interconnected they are. And, and one hurdle for many of the attendees and my audiences for this book talk is this idea of putting both human and non-human interests under the same umbrella. And so while I'm not lumping them together in all ways, I am making distinctions in the book that there are different degrees of protection that the law should afford to human future generations, and that's somewhat different than the protections we might afford to wildlife or natural resources. But the overall focus is that they are all worthy of protection and representation in the legal system. And ultimately, that is the first step in the book is emphasizing how the law is already recognizing that legal protection outside of the context of climate change. This is already happening. This is not something brand new that I'm proposing in the book. We are already seeing legal protections for these three categories under the law. What the book adds to this is this context of climate change and how the context of climate change really underscores the interrelationship be, uh, among these three categories. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more, but it's important just at the outset to understand how inextricably connected these three categories of the voiceless are. So the climate change piece adds this common vulnerability that these three categories have. All three categories are imperiled by the climate change crisis. And without advocacy for enhanced legal protection for their interests, they are most likely to be ignored and obliterated more readily. Um, and so this is uh, something that I'm going to trace for you in the evolution of environmental law, how the law has become more sensitive to vulnerable human populations and how this is really a next step to be sensitive to vulnerable non-traditional non-human populations as well. The law is fully capable of affording that protection. There needs to be a first step of political will that it's something we ought to be doing and that's the advocacy in this book project. So <clears throat> as an optimist by nature, someone who tries to see the glass half full, um, much of what you hear about climate change is about how it's a common threat, a, a common catastrophe waiting to happen for many human and non-human interests. Uh, our economy is threatened. Everything about how we live is threatened by climate change. But from a legal protection perspective, I also see climate change as an opportunity for us to get it right in terms of how we regulate the environment. Um, and I'm gonna give for you a sense of where we've been in regulating the environment and how our focus needs to shift to something that is more ecocentric in nature, more, more uh, cognizant of the interrelationships among humans and non-humans. We are not so different as the law has been treating human versus non-human interests and living human versus unborn human interests. So, so this is just a reminder that uh, the way the law ought to be working is that we do share a planet, whether we are human, 
or non-human wildlife, whether we have wings, leaves, or orange comb-overs, we're all in this together. We're all in the challenge of life on Earth together and all of the perils that life on Earth, Earth holds, prim primarily now the threat of climate change. And ultimately, it's not hard for us to recognize that we do indeed share this planet with non-humans, and yet the law has been slow to recognize in environmental law that it needs to be embraced as a regulatory paradigm. So I want to give you this quick background on environmental regulation to underscore this reality. Um, environmental law took off in the US in the 1970s. F federal environmental law as we know it in the US essentially emerged all of a sudden uh, in, on the coattails of Earth Day and the, the Stockholm Convention publicity and the delay that this statute causes. And ultimately, projects did not go forward for other reasons outside of NEPA's requirements. But it was a very good way of sharing with the public consideration of what we were going to do to the environment before we did it. And that model is quite powerful. And again, to oversimplify, a core proposal in my book is to transform that procedural approach that we see in NEPA, embracing sustainability and aspiring that we ought to be doing it to a mandatory substantive approach, how sustainable development should prevent projects from moving forward if a determination is made that they are unsustainable. And I'll give you an example of that later in the presentation that we're already seeing in other countries. So, from the 1970s, these laws were very, were very effective in addressing pollution problems. Very, very successful. Um, they included citizen supervisions, many of them, and that also helped to enforce these laws very effectively. And then we had this next awakening that even though we have these great environmental protection statutes that are addressing all kinds of pollution problems, we were seeing that depending on who you are and where you live, you might not get the full protection of these laws. And these studies started to come out in the late 1980s and were focused initially on African-American communities and shocking studies that led to results of 80 to 90% and more of undesirable environmental facilities were located in African-American communities nationwide. Uh, we're talking about landfills, uh, hazardous waste facilities, uh, heavy industry, all the things that most of us would not want to live near, predominantly these things, these entities, these facilities were located in African American communities. And that's a, a very stark and unfortunate social, econ, socioeconomic reality, but it's something that the law could do something about if there was political will. So ultimately, um, this awareness grew, it became known as the environmental justice movement, how we wanted to have this sense of more equality in how environmental protection took place. And so now environmental law had more of a sensitive and human face to it than its initial foundation of just protecting against pollution. Um, and this went from a US focus to a global focus in many ways. This, this foundation of environmental justice blossomed into what we now know as climate justice, which operates from the same principle that when we think about some of the most severe and immediate impacts of climate change, most of the communities that are experiencing those most severely, first and worst, if you will, are vulnerable environmental justice communities. On a global basis, that is not just African-American communities. We're also talking about other rac racial minority communities. We're talking about low-income communities. And globally, we're talking about small island nations that are vulnerable to sea level rise. And so this awareness of the law needing to do a better job to protect the vulnerable is really where we've been for the past 20 years. And it's seen varying degrees of success. But to, again, to oversimplify, I would say there's been promising talk about this reality and how we need to do something about it, but it hasn't translated into enough concrete solutions for these vulnerable communities in the US 
and globally. Uh, under U.S. environmental law, the door was slammed in around 2000, uh, the year 2000, on using the 14th Amendment of our Constitution to fight back against these environmental injustice realities. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately concluded that that is not something our Constitution can protect against. It was considered um, discrimination that was not intentional, and therefore it was not going to be something the, the 14th Amendment would protect against. But nonetheless, there's been a lot of very helpful developments in injecting environmental justice thinking into the way we regulate. So that was a positive development overall, but a lot of work needs to be done. So what this slide summarizes is where we were in the 70s, the first box, this idea of the anthropocentric approach to environmental regulation. We're taking care of the environment, but what we're really doing is taking care of ourselves as humans. And then a more human-focused social justice lens um, about 20 years later, and also the rise of sustainable development as a way of thinking, being more careful about our interaction with the environment, and the climate justice movement emerging as well. And this final box is where we are and where we need to continue to head. And that is arguably the opportunity we had and didn't use back in the 1970s. That we really, if we care about protecting the environment, we need to be doing two things that haven't been done effectively to date. And that is higher governmental stewardship responsibilities. And ultimately, we all need to be stewards of the environment. But if there's not a higher demand for what the government needs to do to protect resources on behalf of all of us and wildlife and unborn and, and children humans, uh, we're, we're going to be in trouble. We're ultimately going to just be continuing with this business as usual paradigm that will be unsustainable. And so this voiceless paradigm that I'm referring to, again, because it's happening in our climate change crisis that we now face, this is a time to rethink. And we're seeing a lot of advocacy right now. Just turn on your TVs. When else in your lifetime did you see a group of 10 politicians talk about an environmental issue for seven hours on primetime TV? I mean, this is where we are now. The environment finally is coming first because it's, it has to. It's, it's where we live, it's who we are. And, and we just haven't been thinking about the environment that way like we would in a different context. If a horse were our only means of transportation, we would not abuse that horse. We would not neglect that horse. We would not eat that horse. Ultimately, we would be stewards of that horse so that we could ensure we have use of it now and in the future. We aren't taking that approach to the planet. We're just seeing it as the, the all-you-can-eat uh, unlimited buffet. So this is where climate change is presenting a crisis that could be an opportunity for a paradigm shift in regulation. And those of you who understand human nature like I think I do, um, humans are at their best when they respond and react to emergencies. Humans are at their worst planning for something that might happen in the future. And that's where, really where we are on, on regulating climate change. We were aware of it. We saw it as a long-term distant threat and therefore put it on the back burner, keep doing what we're doing. Our day-to-day -day lives seem fine. And now we're just encountering regular daily reminders that this is for real. It's not some distant remote threat it is what we have to confront if we are going to continue to survive in a sustainable manner on this planet. So I wanted to take you through briefly some case studies that I find very encouraging that are happening on each of these categories of the voiceless that will set a stage for, for how we could move forward for better protections. So one development that you are probably aware of to varying degrees um, just by reading newspapers uh, and your daily news on the, the internet. Um, many lawsuits over the past five to 10 years have been filed with respect to climate change. And these are categor categorized across many different parameters. I've given you two fundamental parameters that these suits fall into. So first of all, 
what you want to understand about these is that this is not an exhaustive list. We are talking about lawsuits that are filed by children on behalf of themselves and those yet to be born. And they're suing governments across the world, the most famous of which, perhaps unjustifiably so because we haven't won yet, um, is the Juliana case in the US. So this is a case that is built into my proposal for how we ought to reform uh, in addressing these uh, challenges with the voiceless. But the Juliana case has been a, a one example of many of youth plaintiffs that are suing governments for one of a few things. In the US, they're suing them because the US federal government has done nothing on climate change. So one theory of these lawsuits is to sue the government when the government has chosen not to regulate climate change. Another theory that we're seeing in some other countries, and the Netherlands is, is one of these, when the government has done something but the plaintiffs feel it's not good enough, lawsuits have been filed to raise the ambition of what those governments ought to do and legally require them to hit that higher level of ambition. And that's what's so profoundly encouraging about the, the suit in the Netherlands, that this was brought on many different legal theories and both at the trial level and the appellate level, this has been a successful undertaking um, and this was not just youth in the Netherlands, but these, these cases have been copycatted throughout the world where, where they're exclusively youth plaintiffs um, and requiring government to do more. And this is highly unusual if you really think about the way democratic governance works. Lawsuits, to the extent they are permitted against governments, are typically allowed for non-discretionary duties. When the law says the government has to act and then it fails to do so, or it doesn't do so in a, in a timely way, a lawsuit can proceed. What's special about these suits is that they are suing regarding discretionary functions of the government. The government decides how ambitious it wants to be about climate change, and that's typically going to be the way it goes. These are elected representatives, they're deciding how to regulate an issue, and what we're now seeing is ragtag citizen groups with kids primarily driving the agenda saying, no, government, you got it wrong. You've got to do this much more if, you're, if you are serious about protecting our future. So this is a huge development, and I would normally go into more details about these cases, but I can assure you that the Netherlands case and the Colombia case, again, youth plaintiffs, that required the government of Colombia to achieve zero deforestation rate after rates of, of deforestation in the Colombian Amazon had gone up, uh, which is clearly not the direction they need to go in this era of climate change. And so the lawsuit has achieved the outcome to mandate that zero rate of deforestation. And of course, as you might suspect, the devil is in the details, actually getting the enforcement of that judgment to hold the government to that very ambitious target remains to be seen. Um, the other category of suits we're seeing, not necessarily involving youth, but important to understand about this notion of demanding more accountability in our society is against the private sector. And these are also an encouraging development. They, they do involve in some ways an assessment of the human rights impacts that climate change impacts are having on communities and essentially requiring that fossil fuel companies that have profited from the destruction of our atmosphere should be held accountable to pay for the damages that are being caused. And, and this is not an exercise in scapegoating. Ultimately, this is about proportionate share of responsibility for harm. So in environmental law, there's this concern over externalities, the idea that you can be an industry and if the government is choosing not to regulate your, your greenhouse gas emissions, you can just pass those costs on to the rest of society. You're not paying to regulate your contribution to a larger environmental damaging outcome. So this is about holding those corporations accountable for how they're contributing to climate change and it is gaining traction in many ways in the US and in this uh, carbon majors petition that originated in the Philippines Human Rights Commission and, and that is um, 
hearings were held throughout the world, including New York in this past year on that case. And then there's the, the wildlife piece. So this is something where sometimes it discredits the movement for personhood. This is a photo that all you have to do is go on Google and type in PETA monkey selfie. This is a case brought by People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA. My son now works for that organization, so he's, he's getting a lot of that uh, uh, angst from the public about, are you sure you want to bring that lawsuit? Um, so this was a, a, a widely publicized case where this, this uh, monkey named Naruto uh, in Indonesia was um, more curious than, than monkeys are, are known to be, even as monkeys. And a photographer was based in a forest and the monkey sh snapped some selfies, some quite nice selfies actually. I, I never look that good in a selfie. So ultimately, PETA became aware of these uh, selfies that were taken with this photographer's cam camera. I, I'm not quite sure how that information was brought to their attention, but it was. And ultimately, PETA sued the photographer, alleging that that monkey had the intellectual property rights to those photos. And of course, this is perceived by many to be a publicity stunt, but it's important to understand the spirit in which this lawsuit is filed because it dovetails with this other line of cases brought by the Non-Human Rights Project. The goal here is about establishing legal personhood for animals. The idea is that both in the Copyright Act for this monkey to have rights to those photos and when we talk about habeas corpus, which is the other theory that is being used by the Non-Human Rights Project, you're talking about captive animals that are held by humans. And of course, these, human, these, these animals did not choose to be held in captivity like this. And there is an effort to use habeas corpus, which has been used to seek the release of unlawfully detained human prisoners. This is what habeas corpus doctrine is all about. And it's being applied now to animals in captivity, starting with higher primates and, and mammals, because these are the most human-like subjects, that there can be more of a sense of connection to holding these kinds of animals captive, because they're a lot like us. Intelligence, communication, emotional capacity. And ultimately, you can imagine how miserable you would be if you were living in uh, someone's basement in a cage. And the animals in these lawsuits are studied and show those similar kinds of reactions. That ultimately, when we talk about personhood for these animals, it's freedom from confinement and freedom from torture. It's not about giving them the right to marry and vote. That's not being sought. So this kind of personhood is appropriate for animals. That's what I mean about it's not the one size fits all when we talk about future generations, legal personhood versus animals and natural resources. Same idea in different variations. So with the monkey selfie case and the human, uh, non-human rights project cases, courts have given encouraging opinions, being sympathetic to this notion, but they have not yet granted relief for the animals in these cases. But what's important to understand is that in both contexts, there's reference to the word person. So when we talk about habeas corpus, there's a reference to person. It doesn't say human. Likewise, with the Copyright Act, it's about persons having the right to receive the protections of intellectual property. And so this is the legal war that's being waged by these organizations to establish that notion that legal personhood should not be limited to humans. There's no reason. Um, so if a ship has legal personhood, why wouldn't a sentient animal deserve personhood? Um, if and as the next slide will show, if rivers are getting granted, are, are receiving legal personhood protections, why wouldn't a sentient animal deserve legal personhood protections? So there was a case in Colombia that ultimately did grant habeas corpus relief to a bear, and that was reversed on appeal. But again, the, you can see the, the, the progress that's being made. It's, it's, a, it's a process that's going to take years, but it's already seen palpable results, even more so with rights of nature. Rights of nature has just exploded in the past five years. And again, more encouragingly so overseas than in the US. Um, but nonetheless, we're seeing progress in both areas. New Zealand is the most impressive example of this because this was legislatively enshrined. Rights 
of nature for the Wanganui River in New Zealand. So this, this river now has representatives, government and Maori representatives, to determine how the rights of that river need to be respected. Um, and that's a work in progress, of course it is. We, we don't know exactly what that means, but we do know that those protections have been enshrined, and now it's just a matter of sorting out the degree to which that will protect these resources from intrusions, from, from human activity. In India and Colombia, courts concluded that rivers in those countries had legal personhood as well. And again, that is now in the implementation phase about how, what that really means and to what degree these rivers will receive higher levels of protection from pollution now that they have legal personhood under those legal systems. In the US, uh, we've seen lots of efforts in this regard. Um, we saw an unsuccessful effort for a watershed in Pennsylvania to intervene in a lawsuit when there was fracking going on in that watershed. And ultimately, fracking is very potentially dangerous to environmental resources. And so an effort to have the watershed represent itself in that litigation was rejected as an intervener party. And more prominently in Colorado, the Colorado River, uh, there was an effort for the Colorado River to have legal personhood, and that was not just rejected, the, the lawyer bringing that suit was threatened with sanctions if he did not voluntary, voluntarily withdraw that effort to have legal personhood for the Colorado River. So depending on where we are, we're seeing more or less receptivity to these ideas, but they are making significant progress. So what does all this mean for the proposal of the book? How am I doing for time? So what, five to 10 more minutes? Yeah. Okay, I want to get questions. Um, so just to, to recap, this idea of protecting the voiceless as the next step in an evolution, um, that we are now in a climate change crisis, that we are now trying to build on ways in which the law has become more sensitive to vulnerable communities. It started with environmental justice. We're now seeing it outside the climate change context with protection of vulnerable natural resources, animals, and future generations. Um, future generations largely occurring within the climate change context. So it's about building on the momentum we're already seeing, but ultimately using the climate change crisis as a tool to advocate for more effective mandatory legal prohibitions. So this slide uh, just summarizes a lot of what we saw in the evolution, but it's focusing now on the, the advent of sustainable development as a way of thinking about environmental protection. And in this third era, we're seeing now sustainable development is starting to be taken more seriously, more in a way of potentially mandatory obligations, whereas the past two or three decades, it was more about just aspirational thinking about how we ought to be living sustainably and acting in that way. Um, so it's important to remember what the definition that we've had for three decades now of sustainable development, what it really entails. The reference to future generations is built right into the definition. And it's about being more serious about living up to that mandate in a, in a mandatory way, in, in a way that the law will require rather than aspire to. So, the climate change crisis could be the catalyst for that transition about sustainable development needs to be something we live by. We make decisions on a project by project basis with that paradigm in mind and not just use it as lip service at the top of a statute in the objective section. So I want to give you some examples about how that can be translated into binding legal uh, requirements. First of all, you need identified bodies to enforce and protect these um, new requirements. And ultimately, there needs to be ways in which they're going to be enforced and uh, information disseminated about those protections. So there are things that already exist, bodies that are in place around the world that protect the interests of future generations already. And I'm advocating for an expansion of that concept that we have guardians for other capacity, uh, those who are not able to represent themselves, 
and this is enhancing that role the law should play about having designated representatives of voiceless communities and recognizing their protections and having someone appointed to step in to, to represent them in, in judicial proceedings. And this can be certainly integrated in how we move forward in addressing projects. So the case that I wanted to share with you from Australia uh, came out earlier this year, and it was a proposed coal mine. And it was a groundbreaking decision, pardon the pun, in how the coal mine was prevented from moving forward. And this is rare. I mean, remember, we're in Australia. Australia is as bad as we are in terms of addiction to fossil fuels. Um, so we have this proposed coal mine, and ultimately the judge is relying quite heavily in rejecting that application for the coal mine on the basis that this significant coal mine will contribute significantly to global climate change. And the logic that he used was even more powerful. He, he took an argument regarding a carbon budget that we need to adhere to. And basically, this coal mine would exceed the carbon budget that Australia has as a country to live by in meeting its climate change obligations. So it's quite logical when you think about how the judge approached this project and why it shouldn't proceed if it's put in the context of what the country needs to do to be a global citizen and regulate climate change responsibly, this is a way of yes, no, we can proceed with just about every project that is proposing some kind of significant impact to global climate change, it will be rejected if we're serious about sustainable development. We do not have to extract every last drop of fossil fuel from the planet before we transition. We can't afford to do that. So we have to be more aggressive about what sustainable development means. At its core, it means we need to be transitioned to green energy 10 or 20 years ago. So an urgency in how sustainability is applied for f current and for um, future fossil fuel projects needs to be applied the way it was in Australia. And there's a whole lot of talk now about the implications of this thinking. So another way that it can translate into court decisions is that, um, skip that slide, um, this idea of, well, what does sustainable development mean? Well, we don't really know yet to a certainty, and that's okay. It's only been around for 30 years. When you think about some of our constitutionally protected rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, those have been around almost 250 years, and we're still figuring out what they really mean. So it's okay to have a working standard that applies and helps that understanding grow over time. So I'm suggesting that we could have a standard similar to what we see as one example in a woman's right to choose. Right now the constitutional standard is, does a particular um, effort to restrict a woman's right to choose, passed by a state legislature let's say, let's say a state legislature requires a woman to view the image of her fetus on an ultrasound before proceeding with an abortion decision. That legal effort to restrict her constitutionally protected right could be considered an undue burden on her right and therefore unconstitutional. Similarly, a standard for sustainable development could be established that something about posing an undue burden on our shared future on the planet, uh, for lack of a better standard, could be applied to projects that are posing some kind of high level of consumption of resources and a, an, an undue, potentially undue burden on sustainable development. So another way of looking at that, Animal Welfare Amendment Act in New Zealand required assessment of feasibility of animal testing, testing on non-animal subjects before you ultimately proceed with animal testing because the idea is animal testing is immoral, unsustainable, and so forth. So if we're going to have to use animals, we have to go through that proce process of saying we tried to do non-human, non-animal subjects and this kind of research required animal subjects. Likewise, the standard could be applied to fossil fuel and uh, 
projects that are proposing intensive fossil fuel consumption, there could be a standard that requires justification for why we're going with business as usual instead of making progress to a transition to a green energy source. So again, these, these are standards that exist already in the law that could be applied to sustainable development and ultimately all of these efforts would be simultaneously protecting future generations, wildlife, and natural resources by living up to the mandate of sustainable development in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, so this goes into a lot more of the legal technicalities of how we can facilitate the legal system to have humans step in on behalf of these non-human entities. And I, I'm happy to go into that if there's interest, but I don't want to spend more time explaining that at this moment. I want to get questions from you uh, from anything that was discussed, and I'm very eager to hear your comments and questions. Yes, go ahead. Thanks for your talk. It was really interesting. Thank you. Something I was curious about was you mentioned some protections for the boys listed in other countries. For example, a river in New Zealand that was considered a person. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if those protections have been spreading from one country to another over time. And if so, sort of what are the mechanisms through which they get adopted from one place to another? Good question. So my first response would be, New Zealand is somewhat unique. So it's important to understand, dive a little more deeply into that context. Part of the reason why the Wanganui River ultimately secured these legal personhood protections is the history uh, of this river. This river is, has been managed for generations by the Maori. And then there was a treaty that there was a long track record of how the government did not honor the Maori's interests prior to and after a treaty with the Maori regarding the protection of this resource. So in part, this personhood conferring for this river was reparations of, of a kind that the government was apologizing and trying to make good on its past failure to live up to its obligations toward the Maori with this river. So that certainly propelled legislative recognition of this river, and that is a very high level of protection. What we're more likely to see is what we saw in India and Colombia shortly after this decision a couple of years later, that courts can step in and recognize um, that they can determine that a resource is so compromised that it ought to be recognized as having legal personhood. So it, there are other countries beyond these that are currently considering and have some degree of these protections already. Another way in which these kinds of protections are conferred is constitutional protection. And we're seeing that uh, most prominently in Ecuador and Bolivia. So they have very strong constitutional language that is supporting a rights of nature approach to, to resources in their country. Um, and, and we're starting to see it in, on a piecemeal basis in other countries. Australia has a lot of positive developments in this regard as well. So I think it is certainly, and, and one thing I didn't mention that even in the US, we're seeing significant efforts at the local level to apply rights of nature protections. Um, starting to creep up to the state level in a few states, but you know, let's face it, we're never gonna see it at the national level. But to the extent we see it growing in the US at any level of governance is very encouraging. Uh, and I think that that ground swell of local efforts is going to start rising to state levels pretty quickly in the U.S., so that is, that is quite promising. Um, but it is always controversial. It is always a, a pushback based on this notion of um, how are we going to be able to develop in any way if nature has rights? We're, we're, we're basically all going to live in tents and, and, and uh, you know, eat seaweed. And, and ultimately, there's a lot of detail to be worked out in terms of to what degree these rights of nature can compromise human interest in their own economic durability 
Uh, and that's, again, like we've seen with constitutional rights in the U.S., that's going to take time for the courts to sort out. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Yes, there's a question over here. limitations of a rights-based approach, or what I think might be limitations um, from a layperson's perspective, fundamentally rights-based approaches are individual-based approaches. Right. And there's something I really don't understand about how ecocentric, which is about interconnection, can ever be addressed by a rights-based approach. So rights-based approaches bring up all sorts of issues. One you've mentioned already is who gets to speak for the voice. Right. That's tremendously simple. And then how, and you've also, how do you weigh rights of one individual against another? Ethically, there is no reason, in my worldview, as I think about it, that a future human has any less rights than I do. And once the Constitution recognizes future, say, Americans, as then, then, then on what basis do you weigh rights? And then finally, another huge area I'd like to hear you reflect on are the rights of property. Because the rights of property and the rights of the individuals first of all, are fundamentally in conflict and some of the cases can be, if you've raised, are there. So, you know, some of us pigs are more equal than others. Once we have rights to property, then rich people, by definition, and rich enables nations, by definition, have more of a carbon budget than everybody else. Right. So, a lot of stuff, but... Yes, yes. Well, that, that just dives right into all the legal analysis that I tried to water down, so that's great. Um, so, just to address those at, at, a, at a little bit deeper level of, of legal analysis. So, um, one point regarding this idea of property um, is that the reason why I, I chose wildlife as a category rather than animals more broadly is that we've got this bifurcation in the animal world of companion animals which are subject to human ownership and, and, and authority versus wild animals. So wildlife to me is, is an extension of the natural world and so that went very nicely with natural resources and then of course the, the, the unborn as another category. So, so this idea about which, to, to what degree carbon budgets should be established on a global level, this is something that is being discussed on a global level and in many ways it's been discussed uh, in one form or another for about 30 years in the global climate change treaty negotiations. To oversimplify, the idea is expressed in this concept known as common but differentiated responsibility. The idea is that all of us in the world share an obligation to do what we can to protect the planet on a national uh, political level. But those that contribute more to the global climate change problem need to do more to address reducing their emissions and those that do less and have fewer resources in the developing world have to do something, but they don't have to respond at the level of developing the developed world. And they are entitled to receive assistance from the developed world in the form of money and technology to assist their efforts to reduce their, their climate change burdens. So going to the first point regarding the um, notion of the scope of, of rights, one point I, I would like to raise there is this individual versus larger uh, entity. Two very promising efforts that are just starting now is rights of nature protections for larger ecosystems. So the two big ones that matter the most for global climate change, Great Barrier Reef, Amazon Rainforest. To me, if efforts to protect ecosystems on that scale could work well from a rights-based perspective, we're doing great things. It's likely going to be very difficult to get that to work at that level because there are so many competing interests and we only have to look back to our efforts to manage national forests in the U.S. to understand how difficult it is to manage a resource that is not only important for environmental integrity but for economic prosperity and how difficult those balances are to strike uh, to, to uh, account for all the interests. So I think what we're going to see is smaller scale efforts, perhaps a resource at a time. Um, 
and ultimately seeing that spread on a, on a, on a larger geographic basis. Um, there was also an, a, a point you made regarding how to represent, who is qualified to represent these entities, and that's something I do address in the book. So right now there are variations in how states um, enable guardian ad litems to step in and represent children. Some of them have to have certain training. Other jurisdictions said it could be just about anybody. My recommendation for who is going to be determined to be qualified to step in on behalf of wildlife or natural resources, it would absolutely require a, an, an expertise, very much like what we currently see in environmental standing jurisprudence in our US legal system. You have to show some kind of relationship to the problem to be able to say that you have standing. You can't just say, I don't like the way the government's policy is working with respect to fisheries, therefore I have standing. Ultimately, there has to be an established connection that shows an injury, a causal link, and something the court can do to remedy your problem. So what I would see here in terms of who are the proper representatives of the affected wildlife or natural resources, it would draw on a lot of that thinking. The idea that there has to be some kind of qualification and connection to those resources to be able to be representing them in a, in a, a legal way. Um, so that's something that is addressed in the book as well. Um, there, is, there is a point that I'm proposing um, a standard that, that is in our federal rules of civil procedure that some of these animal personhood cases are using, and it's called next friend. So the idea is that for an entity that is unable to represent itself, this next friend concept is available, and it doesn't by its terms limit the representation of a human entity in a next friend way. So this part of our Federal Rules of Civil Procedure was used in the famous SeaWorld case. So PETA, um, again br bringing this suit, was suing as a next friend on behalf of Tilikum the orca who was held at SeaWorld um, in, 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 in an inhumane way. And so the court didn't ultimately resolve that question. It threw the case out on other grounds. It said that you can't use the 13th Amendment as a way to free Tilikum. The 13th Amendment prohibits slavery, and it was clear in the 13th Amendment that slavery was a prohibition against confining humans, not other non-human entities. It makes reference to, except for commission of a crime, animals can't commit crimes. So this uh, next friend mechanism was used in the monkey selfie case, and that the court did address and said it, it was not appropriate to, to use the next friend uh, mechanism to step in on behalf of a non-human. But that is just one case that has not reached the Supreme Court. So it's still an unresolved question as to what degree humans can step in and represent non-human entities under this notion of a next friend of someone who cannot represent him or herself. In the back. Uh, I myself, but, uh, in 1975, I had a class called Environmental Law. Uh, I was a non law degree major, I was environmental science, but uh, uh, I remember a book that was a mandatory read, it was The Tree Had Standing. Yes, great read. And so it's something that you know, I would recommend for the people here. Absolutely. I I cite it regularly in the book. Uh, so, so that was one example of, of a few others that, of thinking before their time. Another is Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. So you've got the Animal Rights Manifesto there. You've got the Rights of Nature Manifesto in Christopher Stone's Should Trees Have Standing. And here we are 30, 40 years later, and we're still trying to, to get a hold of that and do something with it. So that's... that's um, that's, that's discouraging, um, but it's important to re be reminded that these, these scholars' thinking uh, is just more relevant than ever in, in the era that we're living in now. We, we need to put nature and animals and future generations first if, if we care about uh, managing the future of the planet. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Sure. Yes, right here. Um, so I, I bring you 
Awesome. Thank you. I uh, studied international development mm. and so in France. Mm. So uh, we do a lot of work looking at things like UNESCO, yes. trying to protect rivers, mm -hmm. and at the same time trying to promote local regional development. Um, do you think there's uh, future potential for overlap between with um, cultural heritage preservation efforts? Absolutely. Um, one, not, not to sh shamelessly self-promote here, but my climate justice book sitting on the table over, here, over there has two chapters that, that talk about that, that potential synergy. One is looking at um, the Great Barrier Reef and using UNESCO protection as leverage to say that climate change impacts to the Great Barrier Reef may violate UNESCO obligations to maintain this resource as a heritage uh, resource and not just as an environmental resource. And another is um, a chapter looking at the Federated States of Micronesia and, and another uh, resource, uh, cultural heritage resource there that is imperiled by sea level rise and, and a similar argument in that context. So yeah, that, that's a great observation. And that's, that's really what, um, environmental law is doing right now, just thinking outside the box in every way it can. And, and the one thing that encourages me most about overcoming a lot of these daunting challenges is environmental laws had a track record of creatively finding ways to hold entities accountable for damage that they've done. All you need to do is look back to the asbestos industry, the lead paint industry, the tobacco industry, guess who's next? fossil fuel, the writing's on the wall. So I'm encouraged by our track record of finding ways to promote justice and accountability. It's just an issue of, is it gonna happen fast enough? Because we got this big clock ticking in the back of our head now with climate change, and we can't let dec decades go by before we get it right. Um, the, the success in the courts, the responses in legislatures has to happen at an, an accelerated pace. Yes, here. That's some. Uh, that, that's an issue that I've done some writing on in the in the climate adaptation context. So, a uh, couple of things. One is, like forward-thinking people in the scholarly literature, um, indigenous peoples are now their wisdom is something we're turning to to understand how to adapt to climate change because they've been doing it effectively and living sustainably for generations. And now a lot of what's called traditional environmental knowledge that they've accumulated over time is a resource for the rest of us to figure out how to adapt to environmental peril. So that is one way in which their, their um, experience with these issues is, is becoming more relevant than ever. But in terms of protecting them and their vulnerability, that's been one of the foundations of why we have climate justice in the first place. So two of the leading cases, one at the inter-American human rights level, uh, which is called the Inuit petition. And this was representing um, Inuit communities across the Arctic uh, in um, Canada and Russia and Greenland and so forth. Um, they were seeking to compel the US to join the Kyoto Protocol, regulate climate change. Their argument was that those impacts that were caused by the US not regulating climate change were accelerating the loss of Arctic ice and essentially creating a whole array of human rights impacts. One great book that I recommend that came out of that is called The Right to be Cold. And it's written by the leader of the Inuit talking about how their very essence and identity is about a frozen culture and that was being decimated, not just by the U.S., but the U.S. and its failure to be a part of the global effort to address climate change was exacerbating that threat that already existed. So the other case was a U.S. case based in Alaska. A native Alaskan community was seeking to have uh, 24 of the largest multinational fossil fuel companies pay for their relocation costs because they were sitting on a narrow strip of land on the north slope of Alaska that 
science was saying would have about 10 years before it became completely inundated and, and uninhabitable. And so they certainly didn't cause this climate change peril and they sought the relocation damages of $400 million to move 10 miles inland to get out of harm's way in Alaska. That case failed uh, for a variety of legal issues that I won't go into, but the, the vulnerability and wisdom of indigenous peoples is a big part now of how we understand and how we need to respond to climate change. So that's something I can share more resources with you and talk a lot more about later. Well, thank you, Randy. This thank has you. been really a wonderful talk. Thank you so and, much. And um, thank you also for your wonderful bridging between technical law and people who don't deal with legal issues yeah, all the time. Wonderful audience. Thank you for the great questions. <laughs> I also wanted to uh, thank Marjorie Kaplan of the Climate Institute and Rachel Schwamm of the, who is doing the governance talk series, who really did the heavy lifting on pulling this talk together. Um, and, and deserve that. So join me in thanking our speaker and the Thank you. Great.